I just give you a little bit of context because I always feel that psychiatry and psychological medicine is only really explicable if we put it in its appropriate context. So the advances which I think happened in the First World War relate partly to the quality of the war itself. So it's 5.7 million men in the UK go off and fight. So most families will know someone who's been serving and possibly killed or wounded. And of course women are then drawn into those jobs left behind by the men. It's also a, a war of attrition with lots of people who are suffering. So Historians are now beginning to argue that the 750,000 killed is probably a low estimate. So the 1.2 million seriously wounded is probably closer to 1.5 million. And although the, you know, there's nearly 450 tragic deaths in Afghanistan, there are a much lower late rate of attrition, 0.2%, if we compare it with the First World War, where we're looking at around 15% of combatants being killed. So... It's a war when you've got a very, very high chance of being killed or wounded, and with that, obviously, suffering from psychological disorders. But just a little bit of context before the war begins. In the UK, psychiatry is an asylum-dominated system. So these are self-contained communities, 1,000 to 2,000 beds, uh, where the medical superintendent dominates. He's responsible for the training and the promotion of the doctors. And so psychiatry is dominated by severe mental illness. You have to be certified. You've, you cannot be admitted as a voluntary patient. And because of stigma, so many of the patients, therefore, are very severely ill. They're suffering from severe mental illness. And there's a move towards reform before the First World War, but it hasn't really got very far. Legislation is still controlling and it's a county-led a county system. Thomas Clouston says, what we want is bright, airy, broken-up hospitals, which are more like hotels than asylums, but it's very difficult to get those reforms pushed through, given the financial and legal constraints. So there's no outpatients, there's no psychiatric facilities, generally speaking, in, med in hospitals or even in medical schools. So psychological disorders are largely at the bottom of the, of the medical agenda. And here's Arthur Hurst talking about the pre-war period. He's a physician at Guy's. He's interested in neurological presentations. And he says, if, if we've got a functional disorder and we can't find an obvious uh, organic basis, we tend to forget about it. You know, what can we do? And he says, this is the pattern that dominates in England, certainly. So the First World War creates a situation where this has to change because shell shock floods through the British Army in the winter of 1914-15. And it presents with medically unexplained symptoms. Uh, not only do people have headaches, tremor, but they've also got stomach pain, chest pain, palpitations. And so it draws and it threatens the fighting strength of the British Army. If shell shock continues, they're not going to continue to be able to run this long war of attrition. And so it draws doctors from lots of different specialists, specialisms to look at this psychological, psychosomatic disorder. And it's the biggest research project that we've seen in psychiatry up to the time. The other thing is that the patient population is different to the asylums. You've got a whole cross-section through the UK population of young, middle-aged men. They don't come, they haven't got histories of mental illness. Uh, and they're, they're breaking down sometimes after winning medals, they're well-educated, they're functioning well. So again, doctors have got to think again, is mental illness really explained in terms of germs, infections, focal sepsis? Is it just degeneration in the new expanding cities? Is it just a question of hereditary? They've got to start, because these, these sort of explanations that they're happy with before the war don't really work when you've got thousands and thousands of troops fit, healthy men breaking down on the battlefield. And again, th this is just to give you an example of the scale of the casualties, the Battle of the Somme. You can see wounded nearly half a million uh, by the end of November. So a massive campaign generating large numbers of casualties. And I always say, if, if you're looking for a Christmas present, I really recommend the Battle of the Somme. I'm uh, not on commission. <laughs> it's the Imperial War Museum. But it is the most brilliant film because... It is pro I think it probably is the first 
uh, uncensored documentary of the first two days of a big battle. And this scene here is the Lancashire Fusiliers. They've gone out of their trenches and they're in no man's land and they're waiting to move forward. And 15, 20 minutes after the cameraman has left, this group of men is exposed to fire. And I, I think what it does, it demonstrates the, the psychological impact of warfare. And if, if, if we ran it, they've had people who have lip-read the, the men here. And that, that man in the middle, it, it, you know, you cannot get a better example of somebody who's absolutely terrified. And you can see on their expressions all the emotions and psychological mental states that you get in battle, from bravado to concern to sort of absolute fear. What, what we've discovered, what the Americans discovered after the Second World War is that psychiatric breakdown, and that's the inability to do your job, is crucially related to the killed and wounded rate. So Wilfred Owen sort of had it right. Uh, the, uh, the dead and the wounded are the line at the top, and the ravaged psychiatric patients are at the bottom. And we know from studies conducted in the Second World War, in the Israeli wars that as the killed and wounded rate varies, so the psychiatric casualty rate varies. But the, you, you can move them apart you know, with high morale, whether you're winning rather than losing. If you're well supplied, you can have the psychiatric rate low. So Wilfred Owen sort of understood this, although he didn't understand the enduring statistical relationship. First of all, the, the British Army, it, it's taken by surprise. Here, Dr. Wilson says there won't be any psychological casualties. We're, we're all robust. We'll cope. There's no problem. So the army is taken by surprise. And as I say, uh, shell shock is not the same as PTSD. It's, uh, there's elements of PTSD in it, but it's a much broader, less focused uh, presentation with lots of physical, unexplained uh, medical symptoms. And this is... William Orpen's uh, sketch of a shell-shocked soldier sitting by the side of a road. Charles Myers is the first doctor to use the term in a medical journal in The Lancet in February 1915, and he talks about impaired sensory perception. And how on earth do we explain this? We can't find an organic wound. Why are these people breaking down? So here's his uh, six cases, I think, um, and trying to work out some explanation as to how these men have got to this state and what can we do to get them better. The British Army, of course, is worried by this because the casualty clearing units are filling up with shell shock cases. What do we do with them? Because if, if they continue to flood like this, we're not going to be able to conduct the war in the longer term. So they set up Mossside State Institution in Maggle, and they get Frederick Mott down at the Maudsley or in King's College Hospital to start doing research because this is like Gulf War syndrome. It's frightening and it could have a serious impact on the conduct of the war. Moss Side is originally, it's built in 1911-12 as, uh, as an epilepsy colony, but in fact, before any patients arrive, it's taken over by the Board of Control and it's going to be used as a forensic unit. But before the patients arrive, the war starts... And it's immediately set up as a military psychiatric unit. Um, and it's partly chosen, I think, because it's remote. It's in the countryside. It, you know, there's all the stigma of mental illness, so they don't want shell-shocked shell -shock, shell -shock soldiers in the centre of town. They want to keep them out of the way. Uh, and I think also with the idea that that will help them as it will be a calmer, more peaceful atmosphere. It's uh, just to compare, the, the, that's the accommodation for private soldiers, so big dormitories, I guess 30 beds in a, in a ward. If you're an officer, you go into this nice house, which uh, subsequently becomes the home of Frank Hornby. So there's always a class dimension in the treatment of psychiatric casualties. And as I said, you get this gathering of um, ambitious, talented young men from lots of different uh, disciplines, and Henry Head says this is this brilliant band of workers who are coming together to exchange ideas about abnormal psychology. So here's just a group of them. Elliot Smith, who's Professor of Anatomy at Manchester, T.H. Peer, experimental psychologist at Manchester, As Ashley Cooper, who's an expert in alcohol, William Brown, reader in psychology at King's, Rivers, we all know about, anthropologist at Cambridge, Bernard Hart, who subsequently goes to University College, 
So all these people come from different parts of Britain to work on this one interesting problem. One of the ideas they explore is that this could be determined by culture. Uh, Elliot Smith, when he's professor of anatomy in Cairo, has the idea that Egyptian culture spreads down trade routes, and so you look at pottery in different places. And they think, well, maybe shell shock's like that. Maybe shell shock is a product of military culture, and it spreads in different ways by groups of people talking to each other. So that's quite a radical idea, well away from degeneration or hereditary, that this is something to do with the way groups of people interact and the pressures that they're subjected to. Frederick Mott, down at the Maudsley, is not really having any of this. He says, yeah, that's fine. You know, your psychological or cultural idea is all very interesting, but I think it's an organic disorder related to a brain lesion. And so immediately, by 1915, there's a conflict between two schools of thought, those who put the emphasis on the psychology and those who think fundamentally it's an organic brain lesion which then has psychological consequences. Because there's no treatment protocols, the great thing is that doctors are free to do what they like. You know, that there's no book which says, in these circumstances, you prescribe this medication for this period of time. So doctors are free to pick ideas and explore them exactly as they like. And the same thing happens, obviously, up here at Craig Lockhart. Um, there's no protocols, no targets. You're free to pursue your own ideas. And really, all the military cares about is getting people better. You know, if you can return all your patients to active duty, that's great. We don't care how you do it. And so here's, you know, a a sort of culture that you wouldn't have got um, in an asylum because the doctor-patient ratio is completely different. I think at Maghall you've got one doctor for every patient, one doctor for 20 patients, whereas in a big asylum you might have six doctors for 2,000 patients. Um, so you can get much more one-to-one -one therapy or, work, you know, exploring different ways of interacting. Um, and uh, the, obviously the book... Craig Lockhart has become famous because of its famous patients, but in fact is a relatively small organisation. I read the other day that it has about 1,700 patients, so it's, it's not representative. The Maudsley treats about 12,500, Maghall gets about 3,700. So Craig Lockhart is relatively small scale, but pioneers some interesting ideas such as ergotherapy. Arthur Brock is a local Edinburgh doctor with an expertise in neurasthenia. And he has the idea that there's Hercules lifting Antaeus off the ground. That what, what happens with shell shock is that a, a serviceman goes to the trench and he's isolated from the community which gives him strength. Antaeus derives strength from having his feet on the ground and being fed by Mother Earth. So his idea of cure for Wilfred Owen is you've been isolated and put in a trench, you've had an awful experience. The way to get better is to go back to do what you really do well and that will boost your self-esteem and confidence. So you teach in a classroom, you write poetry, you go off on geological trips, and you re-engage through occupation and vigorous exercise. It's very great emphasis on engaging the patient in their own cure. So one example of a new intervention. Rivers, different idea. R Rivers is more interested in Freudian ideas, so he's looking at childhood experiences. He, the famous case he treats is the officer who is unable to um, put... Every time he goes into a dugout, he has a panic attack. And Rivers reveals that as a child, as a small boy, he was locked in a cupboard by his nanny. And he believes it's repressed conflict from his childhood that's really determining uh, his behaviour in the dugout. And so they explore all these ideas, and apparently Rivers argues he's cured because he's able to travel on the underground and return to active duty. The other big thing that happens in the First World War, which moves psychiatry, is that people are now treated in prestigious properties in the centre of town. No longer are you going to a, a remote location out in the countryside because people from good families with good family histories are breaking down. Rich people are willing to spend money renting big accommodations, centrally located buildings and paying for the very best treatment. And they're providing an atmosphere of recovery. They, they're deliberately designing them so that they're not like the asylums. They're, they're trying to find an atmosphere of repair and recuperation. So here, Palace Green, these, this is now Embassy Row in London. This was a shell shock institution. 
um, uh, and taken over uh, for the period of the war. Um, it's mentioned by Stuart Kluger, who has... Elect- what, their initial idea is that you have to have a period of complete and utter rest. So he's put in his room and left there for weeks and not allowed to go out, not allowed to talk to people. The idea is that his nervous system has complete and total rest. Uh, he gets around this by saying that he's very religious and he needs to talk to a priest, so the priest comes every day, and he gradually then engages with, his, with the nurse, Eileen Horseman, who he subsequently marries. In fact, he becomes so attached to her that when he's discharged, he makes himself ill again, so he can have another three months' treatment. <laughs> and he does this by drinking alcohol, drinking lots of whiskey, not eating, but not getting to the point where he's always drunk. And he says this recreates tremor and a look of uh, real illness, and he gets another three months' treatment. Anyway, the Ministry, Ministry of Pensions is set up in December 1916, and this, they follow this what had been charitable institutions. So they set up their own homes of recovery. And the, the best-known one is probably 80 Lancaster Gate with a gymnasium for physical rehabilitation. So again, right uh, you know, uh, near Kensington Gardens, you, know, you couldn't get anything less like an asylum than that. And Siegfried Sassoon says he's there in 1918 after he's wounded in Italy. What a wonderful place to go. Um, you can't not but get better uh, coming here, where he's, and he's visited by rivers. So what does the Maudsley do? Uh, the Maudsley is uh, under construction at the beginning of the war. It's designed to treat Londoners, uh, paid for by the LCC. In 19, towards the end of 1915, it fills up with shell-shocked hospitals, uh, shell-shocked patients. And you can see that uh, it was a class-driven building. The little tiny entrance on the left-hand side is for patients, and the big entrance in the middle is for the doctors. <laughs> and the outpatient department is over here. So they've got to walk all the way along at the back down a corridor before they see anyone. Okay. So, as I said, nearly 12,500 cases, mainly for investigation and then some treatment. uh, Mott's key idea was an atmosphere of cure. He wanted to create an... uh, the sort of. I think what they thought was, when do you feel really good? You feel really good when you're on holiday, when you're at the seaside, when you're relaxed... And they try to recreate this environment. So they have tennis courts, social activities, dances, coach trips, occupational therapy, graduated exercise. So it's, everything is designed to lift the morale of the servicemen. And this is one of their key treatments, open-air treatment. They had these huts in the grounds of the Maudsley. Uh, the observation was made at Air Asylum in about 1909. They had... Patients who had both severe mental illness, to dementia, prycox, and also tuberculosis. And they thought that those that had both and were given fresh air treatment, they recovered from their mental illness much more quickly than those that didn't have the TB. So the idea was to create the environment of a TB sanatoria so that you got sunshine and fresh air. And this was designed to provide a sort of healing atmosphere. As well, I think they, they thought, because they're exploring a sort of germ theory of infection that it would uh, uh, treat the underlying pathology as well. And this is directly translated into the 1920s and 30s. These ideas at the Maudsley. So this is the Maudsley private patient block, built in 1939, and the whole emphasis is on fresh air and sunshine. These verandas here are so beds can be pushed out in the morning. It's, it's southward facing, so it's just like a vineyard. All the buildings are orientated to face south, so they get maximum sunshine. And the top is an enclosed garden. One side is for women, one side is for men. And they're beautiful Italianate gardens, but with very high walls and glass, so the sunshine comes through. They're obviously worried about self-harm, hence they have the very high wall and the enclosed, glazed uh, veranda on the second floor. So you can see the ideas that are worked out pre-war, during the war, then are pushed in the 20s and 30s. And here is the... So each of these are individual rooms, double doors open out. In the morning, the patient is pushed out, so they get the maximum amount of sunshine, fresh air. And they also spend, they make a point of spending more money on food so that the quality of the food is better than over at King's College Hospital. But not so good if you're a private soldier. (laughs) This is the main block of the Maudsley, and it, it looks Victorian, but it's only just been built. It's brand new. Uh, and it's the traditional 30-bed, I suppose, ward, and these are private soldiers in about 1918, 
but you can see there's something of the TB sanatoria with the big high windows uh, and f the idea of fresh air flowing through. So th this is the Maudsley treatment regime uh, in the 1920s and continues through to the 30s because obviously they have no antipsychotic medication, no antidepressants. All they've got is sedatives and I guess uh, from the 30s amphetamines as well. Knowledge is diffused from these centres of study and experiment. You can see here, Peer goes to Manchester, Rivers goes to Cambridge, Bernard Hart to University College, Farquhar Buzzard to St Thomas, T.A. Ross goes to the castle. So these people spread out, a bit like the culture theory, taking their ideas with them in the post-war period. And this is my favourite photograph, taken outside the Maudsley in December 1918. It's a shell shock conference, and they've gathered together all the experts of the day. So uh, there's Frederick Mott here, Rivers on the far side sitting down, Farquhar Buzzard sitting next to him. He becomes Professor of Medicine at Oxford in the 1930s. There's Bernard Hart on the far end, T.A. Ross here, Jimmy James, George Riddock, who becomes the British Army's neurologist, Frederick Goller, and Wilfred Harris. So they, they've got all these specialists, and they're, they're, they're doing a training day. Um, so it's the sort of culmination of study, really. And uh, here, here's some of their publications. So they, they get pushed into the medical curriculum as well. And Elliot Smith and Peer are absolutely convinced. They write this book in 1917. It causes a lot of problems because they say, we've learned so much, we mustn't forget it when the war ends because we'll see these presentations in industry, in offices, in the suburbs, you know, and we mustn't forget what we've learned about psychological medicine and functional symptoms. So I'm arguing that the war pushes, has, pushes these new institutional and ideas uh, in, into the 1920s and 30s. There is, however, a bit of a false dawn. Everyone thinks that the cure for mental illness is just around the corner. So here you've got the Professor of Physics at Cambridge saying, in 1925, we're an inch away from discovering the cures for schizophrenia and hypermania. There is a sort of false optimism. They think because Mott and others have noticed that general paralysis of the insane is tertiary syphilis, so there's an infected element, there's infection, that we will discover the link between other common infections and severe mental illness. So thinking dysentery, influenza, that there must be some there must be a common infection because they're common mental illnesses. And there's a big sort of misunderstanding as a result of the gains they've made. And more sort of wise, cautious individuals like Maypother say, Well, I'm not so sure. You know, his mother's uh, in, a, in an asylum in um, Ireland and his sister's got severe mental illness and he's seen it at first hand and he says it can't be that easy. You know, if, if it really was that simple, we'd have worked it out by now. But nevertheless, you know, ideas are developed. So McDougal, shell shock doctor, down at uh, Netley and then at Oxford, talks about a psychobiological model different, and works on differentiating different types of emotion. So trying to work out different ways of perceptual thinking and feeling. So definitely new ideas coming from him. And this is almost forgotten. That in 1919, the Ministry of Pension sets up a psychotherapy network for shell shock. They open in outpatient clinics for specially trained doctors to treat shell shock, and they do brief focused psychotherapy, 29 of them across the country. Obviously, the, you know, if you work out the number of people with shell shock, we know at least... 80, 100,000 get a pension for shell shock. So the total number who suffer a breakdown is probably 200,000, maybe even 300,000. So they're, they're a drop in the ocean, but at least they're starting to do something. And I have found some notes of a few people who were treated, and they're doing dream analysis. They're, they're trying to do some trauma-focused psychotherapy. They're getting the patient to talk about their, their nightmares and to go through the traumatic experiences and trying to normalise them. And he gets 22 sessions, and then another 16 sessions. So there is the sort of beginnings, maybe, of brief focused psychotherapy. Castle Hospital opens um, down in uh, Penshurst. And we saw the picture of T.A. Ross, um, and it's privately funded, and that continues to function to, to this day. So here's an example of trying to replicate a specialist military hospital 
dealing with psychosomatic illnesses within the civilian population. And again, picking somewhere that's a therapeutically friendly place. Same thing, the Tavstock Clinic opens in 1920, Crichton Miller, shell shock doctor as well. The real problem they have is funding. All these organisations struggle to get money. Um, and the MRC and Rockefeller Foundation will not give him any money for research or training. Departments of Psychological Medicine open in the medical schools, uh, and the idea is to bring some of these new ideas into training. And even Edward Maypother in 1932 starts to teach medical students at King's. Until then, he says, I'm, I'm not teaching medical students. Psychiatry is a postgraduate discipline. It's not something medical students should uh, should learn, but he has to give in because he runs out of bed space and King says, we'll give you a ward, but you've got to come and teach the students. <laughs> so he, he says, well, I need the bed, so I'll teach the students. <laughs> um, so there is a period of disillusionment. Um, I think by the mid-1920s, all these expectations, all this hope has dis- diffused and people are beginning to realise that this was a false dawn. And you can see the number of patients in public asylums in England world just gr- continues to grow and, and doesn't peak until 1959. So all this impact hasn't changed the fundamental way that people are treated. Um, and I think May, May Pother does see this coming. And you know, May, May Pother, when he opens the Maudsley, says, we're going to find, we're going to treat difficult cases and we're going to find the answers. But by 1925, he's actually picking um, different groups of patients. He's picking the easier, less severe disorders because he knows that he can't get the really severe cases better. He doesn't have the, the drugs or the in, you know, innovative techniques to really restore people to health. So here he is in 1931... He's now decided the solution is long-term, multidisciplinary research. He says you've got to have scientists from lots of disciplines full-time working on this. It's too difficult for doctors to do in their spare time. Uh, By now, it's very clear from the Maudsley statistics that people aren't getting better in the numbers they'd hoped. And here we are, 1937. This is said to be the most modern hospital of the time. Uh, But it's exactly the same as the ones you've seen before. It's a 1,000 beds. Similar layout. I mean, it's got nice architecture. It's got an Art Deco sort of, you know, boiler house. But hasn't really changed that much from, you know, before the First World War. They, they've sort of gone back to the old ways of, uh, you know, containing people um, and hoping that they'll get better in a therapeutic environment with fresh air and sunshine. So my argument is it's incremental gain. It's, it's not a Whig history. It's not all moving forward nicely. Um, there's some gains here, but there's falling back. And shell shock has its impact really on healthcare professionals. It doesn't change the public perception of stigma. Stigma endures. Um, so I just wanted to... The, the last part of the talk was really to look a bit at the Second World War and to look at civilians and emergency workers... Um, because unlike the First World War, you've got more chance of being killed up until the end of 1942 if you're a civilian than if you're a soldier. It's only after 1943 that the deaths from soldiers exceed those of civilians. 60,000 UK citizens are killed in the conflict, and London alone has 80,000 casualties. So you are really at risk if you're living in a big city subject to air raids. And what they begin to see, and of course this this observation isn't made in the First World War, is that by 1941, a lot of emergency workers are beginning to break down in large numbers. So these are firemen, ambulance men, police. And I've been studying their their cases last summer um, at the War Pensions Agency, and I was shocked to discover that a lot of these people working in the National Fire Service were not volunteers, they were middle-aged men who were too old for the army, and they were just told, join the fire service. You've got no choice. So they were working in London, night after night, doing the most dangerous jobs, not having chosen to do it, not very well trained. Initially, they only had one uniform, so if it got wet, you just had to carry on wearing it. They were sleeping in uh, converted schools. They were climbing up, climbing over buildings, up ladders. They were at risk of being burnt, of being blown up. They were handling dead bodies and had no real training. Um, and they're not, terrib- they're not really supported either. 
And a lot of them then made claims for war pensions in 1945, saying, I was on duty every night throughout the Blitz. I was on duty during the V1s and V2s, and I've got all these symptoms. And then they'll analyse which station they've been at, and they'll get reports from the station officer. He'll say, well, he didn't do anything special. He was just like everyone else. There's no... They don't fully appreciate the psychiatric trauma that a lot of these emergency workers went through without adequate training and preparation. A few people like Lord Horder think we've got to do something because they are breaking down and they set up these convalescent homes in the countryside where they can go for a long weekend. And by 1944, 30,000 have gone there for a respite. Roffey Park is opened. Again, a group of industrialists, a group of Uh, big uh, commercial companies buy this uh, house and they provide occupational therapy in beds and it continues into the post-war period um, to treat workers who are suffering from stress and strain. Um, But it's done on... It's it's a bit like the First World War where we had these houses being set up for shell shock. So what was done in the First World War for officers with shell shock is sort of beginning to be done now for civilians and emergency services you're quite lucky if you manage to get to one of these places. And this, I think, is virtually the only study done in the war of emergency workers. And it's by Eric Gutman um, and Baker up at Mill Hill, which is the Maudsley Hospital in Mill Hill uh, Public School, which they occupy. And they are seeing significant numbers of firemen, um, and they're discovering that... um, the, their easy explanation is to say, well, they had a family history of psychiatric illness, it's not the war, it's that they come... You know, the, it was the argument put forward um, in the First World War for shell shock that the soldiers who broke down were those with a family history of mental illness, and they're saying the same thing here. But they do notice that 51%, the event seems to be absolutely causative, um, and they're beginning to work out that maybe the event is possibly more important than the predisposing characteristics. But it's, it's, these are just one publication, and people are just beginning to think about some of the ideas that lie behind PTSD. The firemen have just about got through the war um, and thinking it's all over when the V1s and V2s come, and that causes a real crisis of morale because they think the D- D-Day's been, we've landed in France, the war must be over. And suddenly the V1s and the V2s come. And as you can see, they, dev- you know, they are devastating weapons in small areas. And they start killing significant numbers of people. So I'll give you an example of, of what happened to one individual. So th- this is a guy who's 46 years old. He's just working in London. He's commuting from Tolworth. Uh, he's a senior clerk in the pet- petroleum board. He goes to bed on the night of the 17th of June, 1944, and a flying bomb falls on his house. He's got a wife and three children. He wakes up in the morning, and he's concussed. He's got cuts and bruises. This is a a war pension case that I looked at. Um, And because he's wounded, they take him off to uh, a hospital in Surbiton. And and he said, where's my family? Where's my family? He said, don't worry. They're in hospital in Kingston. Don't worry. And after about a week, when he's recovered from his wounds, they say, well, we have got some news for you, which we've held back. Both of your daughters were killed by the bomb, but you don't have to worry because we've buried them for you. The funeral's gone ahead, so you can now go home and try to you know, rebuild your life. Your wife and your son are recovering in hospital, but will get better. He then goes, and he's awarded a war pension, not, not because they're concerned about his mental state, but because he's got cuts and bruises. He continues to suffer, and I've followed his notes for quite a while, with severe headaches, anxiety and dizziness. But they take his pension away in February 1945 because he's recovered, and they say, you have no history of mental illness, and you've suffered a severe emotional trauma, so what you're experiencing now is grief, and we don't want to interrupt the grieving process. They're very worried at this time about secondary gain, so primary gain is the relief, relief from anxiety attached to the event. Secondary gain are all those sort of benefits that may be added on. So if we give you a pension, you have no reason to get better. So this is a really harsh policy, which took me quite a while to come to terms with. Um, and there were, there were lots of cases like this in the files. There was a young boy who was 15. He was a GPO um, delivering telegraphs for the GPO. 
Same thing, he goes to his house, V1 falls on the house, he wakes up in the morning, both his parents are killed, his aunt survives but is severely wounded. And he manages to go back to work, but he, go, he has terrible, really awful continuous headaches for years and years and years, and they give him a tiny pension. But at no stage does, does this really get addressed, um, and he's seen by a psychiatrist for at least 10 years, and I, I just followed it up to see what happened to him. And I, as far as I can see, his headaches never really went away. So 50,000 war pensions are awarded for psychological disorders, and it's about 10% of the total in the Second World War. What we don't know is how that 50,000 splits between soldiers and civilians. And, uh, sadly, I don't think we're ever going to know because this war pension archive has now been decimated. Um, my, my guess is that possibly a quarter would be for civilians. And as you can see, it's a higher percentage than in the First World War. There's much bigger numbers, 84,000 for shell shock, just because you've got so many more people in the armed forces, I think. Much higher casualty rates. So my argument is that the Second World War does for civilians what the First World War had done for soldiers. It legitimises their inclusion within trauma psychiatry. So now civilians have a claim for treatment. And we can see that reflected now with terrorism, that the Blitz is the historical reference point for how people behave when exposed to you know, horrible um, uh, acts, you know, explosions, um, traumatic experience. So I, th I think may maybe the, the ground is being laid here for trauma psychiatry beyond the military. And I guess my final point really is that, uh, I'm willing to talk about this more, that advances in medicine obviously take place for a lot of different reasons. You, you may have a scientist or a doctor who discovers something. They do research and they have some fantastic innovation which moves things on. But I wonder, in psychiatry, and particularly in psychological medicine, it seems you almost need a national crisis where the well-being or welfare of the nation is threatened, where there's some external threat, and that galvanises people to work together in big teams and to think of new ideas and to go beyond this established asylum system. So you get new ideas like group psychotherapy being developed in the Second World War, which had only, was only sort of being explored at Rumwell and places like that in 1938-39. Um, and the whole psycho psychosomatic medicine movement of the 1950s and 60s grows out of what I think military doctors have learnt in the Second World War. But the bad news, the, the, the opposite side of this, is that war allows people to do absolutely horrific things as well. Um, and one, one chilling thing, I, I took students to, we went and looked at the Holocaust exhibition just before Christmas, and we saw there that Hitler had pushed through the T4 program, which is obviously killing psychiatric patients. He, he decided, to, he, he delayed the policy until war had started. He said, you can do this much more easily in wartime. Um, so things like leucotomy really take off in Britain. The first leucotomy is about 1941-42 down in Bristol. And then they, they spread, William Sargent and others push them. Because in wartime, I think people feel they can take bigger risks. Um, and people aren't quite so focused on ethics and human sort of rights because everyone else is you know, engaged in a war of survival. Um, so... War does seem to move things forward, but it also creates opportunities for abuses as well. And we, my final point is that we, um, in the year 2000, we voted at the Maudsley. Everyone decided what was the worst psychiatric patient, uh, worst psychiatric paper written in the 20th century. And everyone put in their suggestions. And the, war, the winner, by a long, long way, was a paper written by a U.S. naval psychiatrist in 1943, published in a major psychiatric journal. And his thesis was that if you cut off the blood flow to the brains of schizophrenic patients, they will get better. And he invented a, a cuff which strangled them for 100 seconds. They lost consciousness um, and published it. And, of course, he discovered it had no effect at all. Um, but this was nevertheless published in a journal. And you've only got to think about it for a few minutes, think, why on earth would you do that? I mean, how could that possibly work? Um, but, of course, in wartime, it's sort of accepted. Um, 
So uh, I think my, 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 overview, my, my view is that um, war, the price you pay in war is so colossal in the First World War that those gains, I mean, we're, we're benefiting from them now, but it's such a terrible price to pay that it's just one small gain from you know, the most awful conflicts. Thank you.